Hi, everyone, and welcome to Learning Space. Uh, I'm Nicole Gallucci. I am postdoc with the CosmoQuest Citizen Science Project. Uh, joining me this week is my co host, Georgia Bracey. Hello. Hello. So Georgia is the formal, formal education lead for, for CosmoQuest, and we have with us Jonathan Roberts. Hey there. Hey, who is a, a postdoc and also uh, one of the recent winners of the Space App Challenge, which we'll be talking about in a few minutes. Uh, first, I actually put together a very last minute uh, hands on demo. Um, I've, we've, today, I've been following the story of a high school girl in Florida uh, by the name of Kiera Wilmot, who um, has been arrested and expelled for for doing a somewhat dangerous science experiment um, in at her school on her school grounds and there's a lot of speculation and stuff surrounding the story people say a lot of things um, but from from what I can tell it, it seems like you know she did something not terribly good <laughs> but not something worthy of a felony and you know official science experiment or not I say play with the science let's go and to do that I'm going to make a little explosion in here but try and demonstrate some proper safety techniques while I do it. <laughs> um, so first of all I've got my safety goggles so if you're gonna play with anything that's gonna make a boom wear safety goggles. That is they're always... cool looking. Very fetching. They <laughs> look almost as cool as my Google Glass is gonna look right? Exactly. <laughs> Okay, a little dorky. Getting ready for those. Yes. I'm getting ready for that. That's it. And I have one of my favorite substances to play with in, in, a, in a plastic bucket here. So I have some dry ice. Ooh, Very nice. So, yes. Um, so uh, you can do lots of things with dry ice that uh, demonstrate how uh, the pressure changes when something goes from a solid to a gaseous form. Uh, and there are various ways of doing that safely and unsafely. I've been around at least one very unsafe demonstration. Uh, don't ever use glass. Don't ever use glass when you do this. But I did find a little, uh, we have a whole bunch of these plastic film canisters. Do you guys remember film? They are hard <laughs> to find. I know you guys do, but I'm sure somebody watching no, is like, those they're so cool and useful, and they are really rare. So. Yeah, you can keep a lot of little SD cards in that container. Ooh, that's brilliant. I never thought of that. <laughs> we, so, you know, tell Dot. We have a lot of these here in the, we, I, I live here in the STEM Resource Center on, on campus, and so we have a lot of odds and ends like that that you can uh, play with. And I have a glove. I have this nice little rubber glove thing. <laughs> you don't want to touch dry ice with your skin. That makes for badness, too. Uh, and you can see what happens when you take a little piece of dry ice. The problem with the gloves is, of course, hard to pick things up. And I use this when I do demonstrations of what comets are made of. Uh, it's really fun to mash this up into a powder, add water and dirt, and you have a comet. Um, it actually outgasses just like a comet would. So you can you see that? I don't know how good the resolution is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> So hopefully on the YouTube stream you'll be able to see that too. And so it's outgassing and I'm going to put it in the little plastic container and put the lid on it and just, you know, set it aside <laughs> and see what happens. But I also have Later. Sean uh, came over with this lovely gooey liquid, which I'm pretty sure is soap and water. <laughs> it but looks green. Can, is it, it green? It's yeah. green. Green. It is green. Okay. I think it's soap and water, but you can also, you know, when I'm not doing comets, uh, I usually have a little bottle of water on the side, and I'll drop some dry ice in the water, and you get stereotypical picture of science. So as it's, <laughs> as it's outgassing, you get the gas and also some crazy bubbles. Uh, because there's a lot more soap in here than I realized there was in the first place. So you're showing <laughs> the changes of... This is why I have a big plastic tray, too. You're showing a change uh, in the state of matter from solid to gas. This is called sublimation. Mm -hmm. Teach this to your third graders. They will go home and tell their parents and be very proud of the word they learned. Um, and yeah, and you get your stereotypical picture of science right here. You can put a little bit of dry ice in, in drinks, just don't actually drink it for that cool smoky effect. A lot of people do that around Halloween, and this is actually going to bubble over, isn't it? <laughs> it's not bubbling over too quickly, though. No. I think like Sean it's... measured out the, the right amount here. No, I don't know. Just... So, so dry ice, fun to play with, but be safe. Goggles, glass, and if 
if you're going to do an explosion, do a tiny little plastic explosion mm. like this guy. So we'll sit here and wait. Oh, I can see how cold plastic is. We'll wait for that to explode. I'm sure that'll scare the pants off of me at some point. I'm going to leave my safety <laughs> goggles on um, <laughs> until that happens. I don't actually you know. have it aimed I'm properly. I do. As I'm holding <laughs> this piece and pointing the other piece away from my face. Okay. <laughs> so, you know. We'll look forward to that. Yes. Be curious. Play around. You know, do science even when it's not an official science experiment. Oh, gosh, it's really cold. <laughs> but be safe when you're doing it. Um, I think that's that's the, the, the lesson I want people to come away with. Um, what ends up happening with the story with the Florida teenager, I don't know what's going to end up happening. But um, there you go. I will I will share a link about that in the comments. And I'm going to set my film canister over here. I'm sure the mic will pick it up. Um, so thank you to Dawn and Sean for getting me dry ice and bubbles. <laughs> so, you can find dry ice in a grocery store usually. That's where I've always found it. Uh, I'm time. impressed that they got the dry ice that quickly. They did. Well, we have. Well, of course, we're in a science building, right? So I know, but still, every science building has dry ice. <laughs> we have a we cooler. Like go upstairs we, and things. We were told we could go and get it from ice cream shops. Yes, oh, yeah, that's ice cream another shops place. have dry ice. That's a good place to get dry ice. That's another yeah. place to get it too. Yeah. In our case, we were using it to make a cosmic ray detector. Ooh, you want to tell us about that? That yeah. Cool. yeah. No, how that do you do fun. that? So actually, it's it's surprisingly simple. Um, so what you do is you get a, a sheet of metal, and you put it on top of a tray that's got dry ice in it, and you turn a big plastic box upside down over the top. Mm -hmm. Now inside that box, you put a sheet of fabric on the bottom and a sheet of fabric on the top soaked in alcohol. And what happens is the alcohol gets into the air inside the box, and the fact that you've got the dry ice on the bottom cools it down, so you get this kind of super condensed gas inside, but it's still transparent. And then when a cosmic ray comes through, just like an airplane going through the air, it causes condensation. So it creates a vapor trail oh. of the cosmic ray in the air. And you can actually see cosmic rays passing through the box. It takes about five minutes for the, 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 um, the gas to condense to that level. Um, but then you can see all these little cosmic rays coming through. And if you happen to get your hands on an actual radioactive source, you can stick it in. And it looks like a big spiky Christmas tree because all the cosmic rays, all the radiation goes out at a given distance and then stops. So you have like an alpha source that goes like two centimeters and then oh, it just stops. Cool. So you see all the little vapor trails coming off. It's really cool. Okay, we're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> we're totally going to do that. <laughs> do we have the radioactive source here? Wow, well, over that. But we do have cosmic rays. Maybe <laughs> Everyone less has so cosmic in the rays. basement. But... Cosmic rays are totally democratic. <laughs> They'll hit you wherever you are. Yes, <laughs> they will. Even in my basement office. They <laughs> the will, even board. in your basement office. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So is that a cloud chamber? Is that what yeah. they, is that another, yeah. okay. That's I've a heard cloud chamber. That. Never made one, though, but. Same thing. Okay. If you have a link for how to do that, um, yeah, no. I think we we knocked Turn together, we we put together a proper thing for it because it was done for a, a science for non scientists course here at NYU. So we okay. did it with all of the uh, the undergrads. Cool. Cool. I'll find right. the link and pass it over. Excellent. Excellent. So that'll be an even more <laughs> impressive demo. I'm out of dry ice. <laughs> um, yeah, that might be one you want to get up and running well before. You start. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna put a bigger chunk in. Woo. Science. All right. um, so let's talk about the main main point, of the, sh the main topic of the show. Um, we brought you on to talk about Space App Challenge, uh, yes. which went down. Um... Oh shoot! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't hard. want to hear that in your science experiment. Isn't that what you want? Actually, you can feel wow. you too. <laughs> oh. Okay, right. that's pretty great. Right. That's bubbles. more what I had in mind. I'm getting distracted. This happens. Okay, well, this so is every day for us. <laughs> this is every day. <laughs> Welcome to science. Oh, and before I get distracted again, I want to remind everyone watching, if you want to comment or ask a question, you can do that on the YouTube channel. Uh, we're watching those comments. You can do it on the event page. We're watching those comments. If you're watching anywhere else and want to use Twitter, use the hashtag learning space and uh, go ahead and do a comment. Uh, send us a comment or a question, and we will try and get that include that on the show. Uh, Greedo B. Just said that uh, Brian Cox did a demonstration of a cloud chamber in his last TV series, so it may have been yeah. something, so, something oh, really? similar as well. So cool. homemade materials doing science, I love it. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Space App Challenge, which happened on April twentieth and twenty first. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about what that whole thing is? Yeah. So basically, what they did was NASA put up a whole load of challenges for people to take on, mm -hmm. and it was a worldwide event. Uh, they say about over 9,000 people got involved. So it's the largest hackathon mm -hmm. ever run. Um, and 
the plan is that people were to, in the course of those two days, they would take on one of the challenges, see how far they got, and present their solutions on the Sunday. And this took place kind of virtually, but also in specific locations. So here in New York, there's a big co-working space called Alley NYC, mm -hmm. um, and we all went along. There was like a few hundred people were at that, um, and we won the New York edition of the Space Apps Challenge, but then there was also like an Abu Dhabi winner, there were some winners in Exeter in the UK. So there's a whole load of different local winners, and all the local winners have now been put forward into a global challenge. Okay. And the deadline for all the global uh, challenges to be submitted properly is midnight GMT, which is in 40 minutes. And you're here. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're so done. You guys we're done. Doing. We're good. You guys are we're good. <laughs> Okay, good. Oh, was a group, of, a group of you working on this, Jonathan, then? Yes, I didn't know How any of the guys before I turned up. I just sent an email around to the, the local email list on the Friday uh, saying I was a postdoc at NYU um, and I was interested in doing one of the challenges. Um, over the course of the Saturday, we picked up a total of seven guys to work on the project, okay. uh, each of whom had different specialities, but none of them had a science background. They were all like one was a grad student at NYU in computer science, another guy was has a big data background, mm. specialist in doing data architecture for enterprise scale companies, another couple of guys who like web design. So it was a very disparate group of guys. Uh, two of them had worked together before, but the rest of us had all met each other for the first time. And we sat down and basically hammered out a solution to one of the challenges. We had a working prototype by like nine o'clock that night. So unlike all the horror stories I've heard about hackathons, we went to bed at like half eleven and we got in at half ten the oh, following day. And we were done. I know. That's not fun. No, 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 that's that's normal somehow. Yeah. We got we got in at like half past ten the following day, and all the breakfast food had been eaten by the people who were sleeping oh, there overnight. Wow. <laughs> so in other words, like people in the corridors, people on the chairs. You know. So which which great. challenge in particular? Though there were several challenges that were issued. Everything from uh, there's some citizen science type projects that that were that were done uh, involving, involving greenhouses, involving uh, asteroid dynamics. What um, what challenge did you guys pick up? So we took on something called MySpace Cal. Uh, mm -hmm. So the challenge was that there was a space calendar which mm -hmm. tracks telescopes and what telescopes are looking at. So there's a whole lot of telescopes up in space, all looking at different objects. But there's no one place to go to find out where they're all looking at any given time. Hmm. Um, and uh, the European Space Agency had an earlier version of that run by the guys on the Integral Telescope. Okay. Uh, but it didn't really work. Um, and they wanted a new version that was up to date and was updated like, every day. So it was all uh, keeping track of everything accurately. Um, and we put it together. But we decided not just to do a calendar. We wanted to actually show where all the telescopes were looking at at any given time. So it's actually a, a visual map mm -hmm. uh, of the galaxy and the space around the galaxy showing where all the telescopes are looking on any given day. I can do a share ah, of that. There we go. So yes, <laughs> there it is. So that is our galaxy. That's the Milky Way, uh, where we are. Uh, and conveniently, astronomers use the galaxy for their coordinate system. So just like yes. on Earth, we have an equator. Uh, on the galaxy, um, the kind of galactic equator is the line along the middle. So as you go up and down from that, you increase the coordinates. And as you go left and right from the middle of that, you increase your coordinates. So it's actually a set of axes that tells you where you are. And then each of the dots is a different observation by a telescope. So the red dots that you can see there are the Swift telescope. The dark blue dots are Herschel. Yeah. Uh, the yellow dots are Integral. Um, and you can see a whole list of the telescopes that we've got integrated into the app up at the top. And if you, if you click those, I then you Spitzer, can do that. I see Spitzer, I see Hubble. Yeah, uh, and so this is for this. It automatically loads up yesterday and tomorrow. So we have future dates as well. Okay. And then if you double click on the background map, uh, you will zoom in. So you can zoom into the Whoa. galactic center. Yeah, there you go. Uh, you double click, we'll zoom back center. out again. <laughs> that was the galactic center. That's can... the galactic center. <laughs> That's the galactic center. Yeah, so there's oh, a glass. This is event. Swift actually looking right at Sag Star. It is, right at the very center of our galaxy. And that's a picture. That's not a picture oh, of Sag Star. That's that's the default picture we load when oh. there isn't actually an image. Unfortunately, we, we don't have an image of the, the black hole at the center of our galaxy to look at. We have at. some very pretty images of the space around it. <laughs> <laughs> you Definitely not with Swift. There's, there's, a, there's a bunch more uh, in there. But we so we scrape uh, the NASA the extragalactic database um, uh -huh, and the yeah. SIMBAD database to get the location information. 
So I think, say, like, click one of the Swift locations right up at the top. Up at the uh, top. Yeah, pick ah. one of those. Oh, here we go. Uh, yeah. Click around Pulsar. a bit and see if you can find one that's got a real image. There's, there are a few in there on this. Ooh, ooh, yeah, there, there you go. go. So now, and then if you click the little thumbnail image. Oh, that's oh nice. I love it. It <laughs> takes you to the NASA Extra Galactic Database. Uh -huh. now, now here, everybody can see the high quality, very modern wow. web uh, <laughs> web 2.0 layout that the NASA Extra Galactic Database has. <laughs> no comment. No comment. Yeah. <laughs> That, but this is a very useful tool for astronomers. As, as, as much as we are amused by it, it is absolutely yes. fundamentally useful. It's, yes. a, it's a vast database of all the things we've looked at. And it gets you to all the um, references. Yeah, yes. yeah. That's really yes. cool. And then down at the bottom, there's like a, a proper schedule, so you can see the, uh, the different the observations calendar. down there. Yeah. Now, Herschel is, cl is closing down, as I understand it. But there's still a lot of yeah, blue, I heard that. blue dots. So yes, so still it's still observing. working. It's still, still working. Hard. They're not quite. Going. Going right up until the point where they turn the lights off and put the chairs on the yeah. table. Well, this is cool. <laughs> and you guys <laughs> came up with this in 48. I'm just going to play now. You guys get to watch <laughs> me play. Oh, what's this? <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, no, we had, we had kind of a... So I, I kind of wanted to do this visual map. Yeah. Um, and so I was kind of putting forward that we might want to, to do this kind of layout so we can actually see visually where everything is. Um, but the guys I worked with were amazing. I mean, they're, they're professional web developers. They were able to knock this stuff together in a ridiculously small amount of time. Now, you had 48 um, hours. You said it, you had it, most of it done by the end of the day? We had kind of a working prototype um, okay. by the end of the day. Um, but then we had to, I mean, I, one of the things that has a huge amount of work in this is the database. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of code on the back end which goes and talks to all the different telescopes' websites, which all provide their data in all sorts of weird and wonderful data formats um, with right. different conventions and different coordinate systems <laughs> and all that. So a lot of the work actually happens behind the scenes, going and just collating all of that stuff and making sure it's like up to date and accurate. And well, all yeah, getting it in galactic coordinates mm -hmm. in the first place is its own little <laughs> <laughs> well, bit of con code. Conveniently, that was somewhere I just happened to have knocking around. Yes, so yes, yes, so that yes. Was Everyone got that somewhere, however well it works. <laughs> it's a different story. I mean, who hasn't had to figure out galactic coordinates at some point? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, well, that's really cool. So, okay, so then um, what else did you guys... So once you had the prototype working, you had this working, um, how was the judging process? What was that like? Yes, that was, that was fun. So um, once we had the prototype up and working, the actual judging process was at 2 o'clock on the Sunday, we all had to drop tools um, mm. and stand up and do a two-minute presentation. Mm. We had one yeah. person presenting and one person working the computer. And we had somebody was there from NASA, somebody was there from... Uh, an open New York public data uh, group, and then we also had an actual real live astronaut. Uh, <laughs> so Ron Garen was in New York oh, okay. to, to do the judging, and he's great. Uh, so we, those guys uh, watched all of the different presentations, um, and then there were a load of local prizes, like best use of different APIs, because people were doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like they had quadcopters that they'd hacked the avionics of so they could like automatically do grids around a room and use sonar to create a three-dimensional map of the, the hackathon space. What? I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice. Completely mental. Was this, was this the ha hardware challenges? Yeah, there were a bunch of hardware challenges. Oh, um, my gosh. Wow. Yeah, so I mean, people were doing some amazing things. Another group took uh, a virtual reality headset, which was uh -huh. one of last year's like big Kickstarters because um, it does all your peripheral vision and everything. And then they created a game in, Un in Unity, which was had the full terrain layout from the surface of Mars, where the Curiosity oh, wow. rover landed. And then they skinned it with all of NASA's um, photography of the Mars surface. Mm -hmm. There was an accurate representation of Mars in virtual reality that you could move around in. Wow. You could go and visit Curiosity. You could go and visit the lander. I mean, the kind of things people could put together in two days was amazing. and. These were, in the vast majority, people who don't have a science background. Right, right. They're yeah. mostly like developers, engineers, data engineers. I'm taking my glasses off. <laughs> I didn't put enough in. We'll try later. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, all these guys just like there were families who brought their kids, who oh, wrote their first cool. code on the weekend. <gasps> oh my gosh! It was, <laughs> wow. it was amazing. You know, it was a fantastic experience, and just to see all. All these people who had this enormous goodwill for NASA who would just give up their weekends to right. come and just and try and see what they could fix, see what they could do. And from what I've heard, this was true all over the world. All the different places where they held these hackathons had the same kind of stories coming out of it. 
Yeah, so these hackathons, um, I've participated in, in a couple before. I am not a coder by any stretch of the imagination. I usually do a video project yeah. um, when I do something like this. But um, it's you're coming together. You may or may not have an idea even when you start, but it's that getting the creative juices flowing, getting people who maybe not work together working on something together, you have no idea what you're going to come up with. Yeah. Right, and that, that's, that's kind of what it sounds like is happening. Uh, what but was you, have some, yeah. okay. you have some criteria. You said there were some special prizes and all, Jonathan, but um, did you know exactly how you would be judged you know, beforehand, or was it a little more vague as far well, as it goes? Well, <laughs> not exactly. It was... Yeah, the, the, the criteria were, I think, quite intentionally fairly loose. They, yeah. they want to give people a very broad playground to play in to see what people come up with. And I think that was reflected in a lot of the challenge entries. Yeah. Um, and also some of the challenges. It's like a poultry farming challenge. <laughs> I was, you know, that, that caught me out a little. I wasn't expecting chickens. <laughs> oh. Amazing. Oh, yeah. there's my space. Yeah, there are. There must be. I, I haven't. Uh, do you know have any idea of how many they came up with? There are several in each category. Some of them. There must yeah. be several hundred projects here that that came out of it. Is there a? So I think there was a total of the on the other side. They said there are about seven hundred and seventy projects were submitted. Wow. So seven, and that's just the ones that were completed, mm -hmm. or right. to some extent. Um, lots of people over the weekend like tried out things that were so crazy they didn't get to present them at the end of the that weekend. That happens too. That uh, totally happens too. But yeah, but that's the nice thing about it. That's kind of the point. So if mm. you go to, I, I put the link uh, in the comments. It's spaceappschallenge.org, uh, and you go to projects. It's just the list of all the projects by category. It's and yeah. like I, I assume like yours, a lot of these are just available. For, for, yeah, so I think they have to be open source, right? They they're have to all be open, open source. source. So all of the code for all of these projects is mm -hmm. on, um, has been put on GitHub. Okay. Uh, so you can just go download the code, pull it down, play around with it. I mean, basically, every single piece of code for our app is up there. So you can download the whole thing. If you can get Ruby on Rails running on your own machine or on your own server, you can pick it up and install it and play around with it. Very cool. um, and that includes the code for actually scraping. from the telescopes. Okay. So for people who actually want to bring that telescope data together themselves, they can actually use our scrapers and, and build their own local database. Or well, for that also happens is you, you start a project and you realize someone's already built this piece, so let's put yes. that in. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, but yes, so we wanted to do something that was useful for scientists, mm -hmm. to actually look at the count of what's being seen. And so up on the top right of the, the app, you can actually click a button which will download the data for you in Export nice, data. clean, plain text, in plain text data. Bio, there it is. Yeah, <laughs> I knew it. that would get you. <laughs> <laughs> but we also wanted it to be like publicly accessible. So there's also a Twitter account which tweets oh. when telescopes go and check out new, uh, new locations. So if you check out the Twitter feed, it will tell you that Herschel's gone to look at a new source or Swift has just spun around to have a look at another location on the sky. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll also put out like space news, telescope news when that happens. So when Herschel goes decommissioned, we'll be tweeting about that. Yeah, it is Space Cal NYC. Yeah, that's the Twitter handle. Space Cal NYC. That's Space Cal NYC. Very cool. Yeah. Um, um, what was yeah. your favorite project? Other project that you saw there? Which one did you like the most? Um, there were some really great ones. I mean, I have to say, I'm. A, Ah, we lost sound. Oh. Oh. Sorry, we yeah. lost you sound there. Go ahead and try again. <laughs> I was blown away by what these guys were doing with a quadcopter. Actually yeah. just creating something which could uh, navigate its own way around place. And then they also had they were had some leap motion controllers to play with. And mm -hmm. so it's like an infrared sensor, so you can get your hand and it knows where your hand is, and you can do very minority report stuff with it. So as you oh. move your hand back and forth, you can control the copter. And then they had it doing like barrel rolls and all the rest of it. <laughs> Um, but it was fascinating because we saw them starting out because they crashed the quadcopter into, I think, every single person. Because <laughs> you're, like, you're, you're sitting there, you've got your headphones, and you're listening to music, you're cranking out some code to get this thing working, and in the background, this quadcopter is like whipping across the room and taking people out. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it was a little hard to concentrate at times, but um, no, it was phenomenal. That's fantastic. Oh, I want to play cool. now. And then there was, there was another group who did a great app. They, uh, they actually put together a full game that you could play start to finish where you get to pick the elements in your spaceship. 
you get to decide where, what kind of power your spaceship's going to have and what, whether it's going to be manned or unmanned or where you want it to go. And they'll calculate the cost of building it and the time it's going to take to get from A to B. And there's really cute graphics. Um, so you can kind of follow through. And it's a great way to give people kind of a sense of what goes into building a space mission, what it requires to get from A to B. And the other thing that amazed me was the people who were writing this piece of educational software had literally just learned it that morning. Because they had no idea what the, I mean, they kind of knew it was expensive, but they thought, oh, well, what should we build? And then they did the learning first, and then they built a really cool educational tool in effectively an afternoon and evening in the morning. That's fantastic. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, have you participated in, in other hackathons like this before? No, this was my first, actually. Okay. I've seen, there's a few, there's a lot of those kind of things going on in New York right now. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to jump in on one of them, and then the NASA one came around. It's like, yeah, I really, <laughs> I really have no excuse. I, I should jump in on this one. Um, and what I, I mean, I actually went back to the department and gave a talk to all the grad students and postdocs yesterday, saying, right, guys, seriously, next <laughs> year, get on this. <laughs> so yeah, this is the second year they were doing it. So then this, this is the is, second year. Yeah, it's going to be a second, another one going on next year. So they're, they're planning this as a yearly event then. Um, I think the official line is that they're just happy they all survived this one. There are only 12 people at NASA running an event for 9,000 people. Understandable, so, yes, yes. So if there are other issues like there. If you see this again, you should totally <laughs> okay. like, get in touch with NASA. Send them a, send them a tweet at, at Space Apps. They are <laughs> yeah. listening. Um, and encourage them that once they've recovered from this one, they should totally start planning for 2014. <laughs> Because I think last year in New York, they had like 20, 30 people jumping on this. And this, this year, there were hundreds wow. of people there. So next year, they're going to have to get a bigger space. That's fantastic. Crowdsourcing, all the awesome. Mm. Um, so your background is as a scientist. What, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about what you do? Yeah, so I used to do dark matter stuff. I used mm. to do theory uh, on dark matter. So trying to predict from our theories of our models of how the universe evolved, what we might actually be able to see if we made dark matter in the Hadron Collider 100 meters underneath Switzerland. Um, unfortunately, there was a slight hiccup with the Hadron Collider, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's a, little, a, a small uncontrolled release of pressure, I think is what they called it. Um, <laughs> uh, so the end result of that was after a couple of years of very successful running and finding the Higgs boson, it's been um, shut down for a couple of years, and they're doing the upgrades, uh, and then it'll be running at a much higher energy where they might... Uh, hopefully find dark matter in a couple of years' time. Um, given the minor delay in looking for dark matter there, uh, I got involved in astroparticle physics. Mm -hmm. So what that means is it's looking at subatomic particles, so the kind of stuff they're whipping around underneath Switzerland, but stuff that's been accelerated in stars rather than accelerated by our own colliders. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the stuff I'm looking at gets accelerated in other galaxies in hugely powerful events in the center of other galaxies like black holes, like bringing in a whole bunch of gas and dust and stars and spitting it out in huge jets. Um, and those things fly across the space between galaxies, and a few of them hit Earth. Mm -hmm. And they're the highest energy particles we've ever seen. They're certainly a lot higher energy than anything we'll ever be able to accelerate ourselves because we don't have an exploding galaxy. We don't have a supermassive black hole. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> it <backyard>. does. <laughs> <laughs> People are down on physicists making things like supermassive black holes in their backyard. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so your goggles, we... guys. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got your goggles, you'll be okay. <laughs> um, so no, we uh, we get hit by these things, and mm -hmm. they crash into the atmosphere above the uh, the Earth. There's about one of these per square kilometer per century. So they're super rare. Wow, yeah. Um, and so to find enough of these things, you have to build massive detectors. So there's a detector down in South America. It covers 3,000 square kilometers. Wow. So it's a huge grid of individual detectors. Each one is spread out by like one and a half kilometers. Um, and when the particles hit the atmosphere, they create a shower of particles, kind of the debris of the collision, which spreads over like a few kilometers, a few miles. And by detecting those when they hit the ground, you could figure out what the initial cosmic ray was and where it came from. Um, and so we've got a few hundred, a hundred or so cosmic rays at these energies and a few hundred thousand galaxies. Yeah. Um, and my job is lining the few hundred up with a few hundred thousand and figuring out where they came from. Gotcha. So they usually get a pretty wide search radius, right? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a... So the detector has an accuracy of, of the order of a degree. 
mm-hmm. um, okay. which is yeah, it's not too bad. There aren't actually that many galaxies very close to us, and their the flux in the galaxies drops off pretty quickly. So we tend we would expect to see the nearest brightest galaxies. Okay. Predominantly, unfortunately, unlike light, cosmic rays don't go in straight lines. <laughs> yeah, so <being> that's, particles. <laughs> that's, having mass. <laughs> that's the thing which kind of screws us up because they they have charge. So oh, when okay. they go through the galactic magnetic field, they get bent around. Mm-hmm. So one of my colleagues um, at NYU put together an amazing model of the galactic magnetic field using things like how light gets distorted when it goes through magnetic fields to effectively X-ray the magnetic field of the galaxy. Mm-hmm. So. That was very handy. He just gave that to me, and I said, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I will acknowledge you in my paper. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Five years of research, full PhD thesis, and he gets like, the citation going, cheers, that was great. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, that's, that's the wonderful thing about science. You get to build on these amazing projects mm-hmm. that everyone else does, mm-hmm. and they all put them out. It's the heart of open source. Everybody gets to use everything. Right. Um, and so with that tool, we can backtrack all these cosmic rays through the galaxy and see where they would have hit the galaxy. And then we can actually try and line them up with other galaxies and see what, which ones of our nearest neighbors are firing cosmic rays at us and hopefully identify what it is that's accelerating them. Because we've no idea what the actual engine is that produces these things. Right, mm. right, right. Yeah, it's, it's uh, so I know we're, we're straying away from education a little bit, but that's <laughs> something I worked on uh, a while back was, was looking at the, at the radio jets from these. Actually, oh, cool. Back there. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes. Look at the radio jets. And yeah, we, as, for as long as we've been mapping and measuring, and, and uh, some people say, oh, AGN or old hat. It's like, no, we really don't know how those jets are being mm-hmm. launched. We really don't know the underlying physics. And it's, it's, it's a fascinating problem. Yeah, and it's, it is kind of cool to be able to work mm-hmm. on things which are the only physical things we're ever going to get from other galaxies. Yes. <laughs> it's, it is quite amazing. And these things were spat out millions of years ago, and they've had a very long journey to get to us. Right, right. <laughs> that is impressive. Yeah. So these hackathons, not just um, for the public as well. I know within astronomy, there's been a couple of, of things like yeah. this. This is how I email met you is through uh, Dimitri Muna, who I met at Dot Astronomy, which is a has a runs a similar thing. So if you're actually uh, an astronomer, um, there's this hacker. There's hackathons that go on at Dot Astronomy conferences. Uh, they've started doing them at, at American Astronomical Society conferences. So the last day of the meeting, we all hole up in a room and make stuff. <laughs> <laughs> which is by the end really of AAS, fun. you haven't lost enough sleep. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I think it was only like an eight hour. It wasn't a full twenty four right. hours, so it wasn't so much the lack of the sleep. Uh, like like when I was at dot astronomy, there was a lot of lack of the sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and again, you don't you don't necessarily have to be a master coder to do this. Uh, you know, somebody with the science background or somebody with an engineering background, or in my case, you know, that do. Zilly videos. <laughs> yeah, and, and this was this was the thing that really surprised me is that a, a, a large number of the people who were there had no coding experience. Mm-hmm. They were designers, or they worked on kind of user interface design, or they were literally wandering around and like taking live video and putting together videos of the hackathon. Mm-hmm. Um, and the actual submission process for the global thing is we had to have a two minute video. Right. So you've yes. got all these like seven guys who, you know, let's face it, we're coding geeks <laughs> and scientists, <laughs> and then we've got to put together a two-minute like audio-visual presentation. That's not really in our compass. <laughs> <laughs> so, Quick, find another person. Know, what do we do now? <laughs> <laughs> so there were young people there too. Is yes. that right? <laughs> okay. Because yeah, there's no, got to be some of these for kids, right? Or just for any age, to, you know. I yeah, no, it was it was great, and there was um, yeah, so there were there were families with kids there. Like I think one of the youngest was we had like eight year olds running around, oh uh, getting involved in these things. I mean, there, there was, so one of the challenges was like a Lego rover project. Yeah. We could create a fully automated robotic Lego rover. Now, Legos, yeah. I I have nephews that could have knocked that out the park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I do too. I've got three nephews. Um, yeah, they probably could have done quite well. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. exciting. Yeah. Do you know of any other non-space hackathons coming up that people could get involved in? Yeah. So uh, mm-hmm. the moment in New York, there's uh, um, there's a something called Big Apps, mm-hmm. uh, which is a New York City open government styled hackathon. Mm-hmm. So New York is very in favor of open government, making a lot of data open, and um, so they've released huge amounts of government data. Uh, out for free. So you can, for example, you can just download every 311 call 
and, oh, wow. and past that. So like, somebody somebody made a map of Manhattan in complaints, like to figure out who complains about what. You know, oh, what the Upper West Side complains about, what the Upper East Side complains about. You know, what bankers complain about down in Tribeca. Um, I always rage about how <coughs> politics doesn't have enough of a foot in data. This is the yes. data. <laughs> Yes, and so they're, they're running this, it runs until June 8th, and they're running lots of independent individual hackathons during that time. Um, and unlike the NASA one, where you get glory, uh, in this one you get cold hard cash. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, yes, so I guess well, they can afford so, it. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and so a lot of these things are sponsored by people like AT&T or other companies that actually want to get in and start using, like just really, it's, it's crowdsourcing good ideas. Um, and there's a bunch of companies that get spun off out of these hackathons. So if you yeah. come up with the best solution, then you've got kind of a proof of concept. Um, you can then go on and show that to people in the company that will come along and say, actually, we'd like to take that further. That's awesome. Um, and I guess we got the equivalent of that out of the, uh, the NASA one, because the European Space Agency that were running the old defunct MySpace Cal have been in touch this last week saying, hi, guys. So we kind of like your solution. We use yeah. our <laughs> Could, could we have that? <laughs> and it's open source, so know, yeah, exactly. sure. So uh, yeah, we're going to be chatting to them and seeing if we can uh, we can get that shunted over to uh, to their servers, unless of course NASA wants to take it, so we can you know, start a bidding war between the NASA and the European <laughs> Space Agency. Oh, <laughs> sad bidding war. T <laughs> totally China. Totally <laughs> open for bribes. Uh, I, I could be bought with a magnum. <laughs> so, you say we could be bought with chocolate, maybe? <laughs> yeah, totally. Ice cream. <laughs> There you go. There you go. Yeah, I, I highly encourage Hackathon. I mean, even I haven't done any any other contests. It was more like for fun. Let's see what we come up with. It's just, it's just a fantastic way of working, uh, meeting new people and and creating yeah, and absolutely. finding interesting things. Um, I think somebody did a three D video of, uh, from one of the rovers on Mars, Spirit or Opportunity, one of the older ones. Made a three D YouTube video. You put on your three D glasses, you're wandering around on Mars. You know, like they did that in eight hours. That's it's amazing. just just amazing yeah. stuff that, that people come out with. And and like you said, really useful stuff like like the um, the NYC the NYC big apps. Uh, yeah. something that's actually useful and, and socially responsible. Yeah. So pretty cool. And also I think hackathons attract a certain kind of person. So mm -hmm. if somebody's giving up their weekend to do this kind of stuff for free <laughs> There's something wrong with them to start with. Exactly. <laughs> really, people run like the wind. They're one of our people. <laughs> it's all good. Awesome. Um, so I know you had another another interest, another side hobby <laughs> job type of thing, which has nothing to do with science education. But I am a geek, and I wanted to yeah. to ask about it since you showed it in the in the little pre-show. Uh, you were also an illustrator, a, a map illustrator. Uh, for yeah, so I on my evenings and weekends I do I do maps of imaginary worlds, uh, and so last year I ended up doing the maps of Game of Thrones. So I did the Lands of Ice and Fire, uh, which is a map book of twelve maps that covers all of Westeros, all of Essos, all the way out past Karth to the far lands of Ashai. Um, so I, I, I spend a substantial portion of my weekends and evenings last year buried in <laughs> Westeros. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, but in total, it's 72 square feet of maps. Wow. It was a lot of map. <laughs> wow. Yes, the lands of ice and fire. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the link, because uh, Dimitri okay. actually sent along the Amazon link. <laughs> I'm just going to okay. share that, because that's <laughs> Or at least this is, a, this is a, for the poster. I don't know if it's the same thing. So it's over yeah. on Fantastic yeah. Oh, yes. No, I so see. My, I see yeah. you. Yeah. So my, my, site, my site for the map stuff, and not my physics stuff in any way, is over on Fantastic Maps. Okay. Because it lists George R. R. Martin as the author, and no, it lists you, it lists you as the second author. <laughs> I was like, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, there yeah. is a bio. <laughs> Yay! That is so cool. Which so does not mention physics. <laughs> How long have you been doing that, the maps? Um, Has that been a long uh, so hobby? I've been like doing bits of drawing for a long time, but I, can't, I guess I started working properly on I actually like, put together a formal company to manage it last year um, when I picked this up. Um, but yeah, I've been putting stuff up for free. Um, and for like the gaming crowd, they, they like a lot of maps. So there's a lot of maps out there for them. Yeah. Uh, and then I started getting work for authors and 
a couple of other bits and pieces. And then, you know, Random House came in and, and that just like knocked me out for four months. Oh, that's <laughs> so cool. How did you balance that with, with doing your science as well? Did you get a lot of leeway to, to work both projects? No, no, I did full days in the office and I did full evenings yes. on my maps and, and after four months I apologized to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds about right. At least you weren't a grad student where you're expected to be doing no. your work days and nights. So you at I, least I, I was able to, there's nothing left. Yeah, I just about managed to juggle that one. That was that was that was not so straightforward. That's cool. Well, I have a birthday coming up, Internet, so it's <laughs> <laughs> on my wish list now. <laughs> so that is really cool. That is that anyway. There's nothing to do with science education no. except that, you know. None whatsoever, except there's a certain crossover, I think, in you know. <laughs> A lot of us watch Game of Thrones, let's, let's be honest. It is pretty amazing. I yeah. mean they're doing a wonderful job of that series. Yeah. Or read yeah. the books, right? Yeah. 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 I, I That's heard good. about the books from my friends in grad school who insisted that I read them, and I was like, I don't really like fantasy, and I, they finally got me to read them when the show was coming mm. out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we uh, left the office on Sunday night and went to go watch it at someone's house, you know, the one person with HBO. <laughs> <So>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like what people used to do when one person in the town had a color TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're doing it, we're going back, at least for a certain age group of us, we're going back to yeah. that. <laughs> It's like, oh, I only have Netflix. I don't get TV anymore. Can I come to your house? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Game of Thrones is, yeah, it, it's great, but I wouldn't say it's widely family appropriate. So my parents are like, oh, this show that's on TV, that's the thing that you were doing the maps for, isn't it? It's like, yeah. Well, oh, we should totally, I'd like to read the books. <laughs> I was like, yeah, probably not. <laughs> I'm not going to recommend those to my mom. <laughs> uh, my little brother actually started reading it. He doesn't like books, but he, he loved the show so much that he, he actually picked up the book. I was so excited. I was so happy. <laughs> so Doing my, for people my... in their 20s what Harry Potter did for it. Like, yeah, late, that sounds early teens, familiar. So. Seriously. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, I want to thank... Thank you for coming on the show um, and, and talking to us about, about this hackathon and, yeah. and all the other cool stuff you do. Well, there, uh, is, cool. there is global judging, which starts on the yes. 3rd to the 7th. Uh, so that vote will be conducted on Twitter. Oh, uh, it's so a public you're, process. If you're up for throwing in, so they, they have NASA judging for four of the prizes, but they have a public vote for the, the public's choice. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, go through, check out the videos. Everyone has two-minute videos now on their site, yeah. so we'll have to have a two-minute video in nine minutes' time, or they're not eligible. <laughs> um, but go in, check out. I mean, this is a worldwide thing. So there are, there are applications from the Middle East, there are applications from Africa. I mean, really, go on, see what people have made. And if you like what they did in, on the 3rd to the 7th, throw your vote into the hat and, vote. and, and, uh, and pick the public vote. Because cool. the people that win, apparently, one of the possible prizes, you might go, get to go to Kennedy and do space training. <laughs> so cool. Awesome. <laughs> oh, fun. Yeah. I'm oh, not yeah. seeing on the website, I do see the map where they actually had participants on all seven continents. There's somebody listed at McMurdo Station who participated in it from Antarctica. So go, That's cold amazing. person. <laughs> go, really cold person, for joining. Um, but yeah, that... Um, I'm not seeing where to, but I, I will look that up afterwards and, and share that out so that you guys can. Yeah, I think um, the vote will the vote will start on the third. I'm not sure they've put out exactly how oh, okay. it's going It'll to be start. conducted yet, but it's we've got a couple of days till that starts. Okay. So okay. I shall be I shall be whipping votes on the third. Awesome. <laughs> See what awesome. we can do. Awesome. That's so cool. good luck. Yes. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. We've got we've got Guido hooked already. <laughs> <laughs> you can comment I saw that. that. It's a dangerous time sink. He's already yeah. hooked. So also, I'm, I'm, I'm uh. telling you, if you are a member of science faculty, mm -hmm. you should be looking at this kind of thing and thinking for next year about a challenge that you can submit to mm -hmm. engage people with the kind of research oh. you're doing and see if you can put together tools, get people to put together tools which open up the data that you've been working on. This is just another way for, for people to enga be engaged in the scientific process. And that, that is something we are big on. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. No, I think it's a great example. I'm really glad NASA's taking it on. Very cool. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank yes. you for having me. Thanks, that was Jonathan. Lovely. Great to meet you and hear about it. Yep. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for watching Learning Space today. Uh, sorry the canister thing didn't go so well. I think I needed a bigger chunk of dry ice, so maybe I'll try another day. Um, that'll be yep. next week's demo. That's science. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> science. I'm still working on scheduling next week's speaker. We're going down the list of people that we've, we've asked uh, to, so we'll have a bunch more shows coming up. 
Um, this week we have, uh, today's Wednesday, so tomorrow's Thursday, Planetary Society has their hangout at noon Pacific. Uh, Friday at noon Pacific we have the Weekly Space Hangout, which is uh, hosted by Fraser Kane, and all of us sit around and talk about the biggest space stories of the week. Uh, and I think actually we talked about this app challenge last week. We meant we we, we uh, got that in in the show. Uh, Sunday night is a virtual star party. We have our astronomers who have amazing backyard telescopes and totally spoil us with amazing views of the cosmos. So uh, <laughs> check that out on Sunday nights as well. Um, and Astronomy Cast on Monday. I think that's the whole weekly lineup. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Right. Very cool. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs>